Hello, good afternoon everyone, and welcome here. Uh, I think a lot of you are locals, and so maybe wondering why on earth I'm standing here, but um, these kinds of events are a collaboration that we have between institutions in the Western Cape under the aegis of SAFI, the South African Association of Health Educationists, where when we have guests on institutions, we do open up some sessions to colleagues from the other institutions in the Western Cape, and this is one such uh, event where Stenabosch is very kindly opened up this afternoon to all of us who are interested, so thanks very much to Stenabosch. So on behalf of Sagi, I'd like to welcome you. I hope you have a great afternoon. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ian, who's going to be call. Just before I do that, and before I forget, um, Paul has very kindly agreed, because we do have colleagues elsewhere in the country who are interested, so Paul has very kindly agreed that we can video the session, and we will make it available on our Facebook page. The question is, does anybody have an objection to being video? Because we will be doing some discussions later, so there may be some videoing of the groups. <laughs> you should have sent out a new one ahead of time. <laughs> but we'll have a quick grooming session. <laughs> We've got a quick grooming group outside. So no, no objections. Good, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Francois, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Ian Cooper. I'm director of the Funder Centre for the Arts and also a uh, staff member in the Centre for Professions Education and we are hosting, have been hosting uh, Paul Burley this week. Um, before introducing, just to say that uh, one of the people who wanted to be here is Bernard Gieder from the University of Pazuzu Natal and my mention in this, he was the one who pushed us to actually video uh, today. So it's so ironic he couldn't be here because he's ill, um, he's going to benefit from what he was pushing for for other people, so uh, it's good uh, serendipity, I guess. So we met Paul here for the week. Paul Worley is uh, Professor Emeritus at uh, Flinders School of Medicine in Adelaide uh, in South Australia. Those who were earlier notices might have sort of seen him described as the Dean of Medicine and Flinders School of Medicine because he was indeed that for 10 years until the end of June. Um, he's just stepped out of that position and he's in a new position uh, as Executive Director of Medical Services in rural South Australia, country South Australia. 62 hospitals he's now uh, responsible for. Um, poor man. Um, that he's looking forward to transforming into an educational campus. Uh, I'm not sure that's what they were expecting when they were going to do, but that's what he has, has in mind. Uh, so, he has 10 years uh, dean of a school of medicine that uh, included everything outside of nursing in terms of all the other uh, professions. I say included because fairly recently there was a restructuring and that's been topped up as, and in fact, further chopping up and changing and conglomerating has happened since then. Uh, if anyone knows, as we all do, universities, as soon as you have a new vice chancellor, you get a new structure. Um, House doesn't seem to have arrived yet at Seven Bosch. I wonder if we're going to escape that, but uh, that's usually what happens. So, before uh, taking on the deanship, Paul was head of the Rural Clinical School uh, for many years and the Rural Clinical School was the first of its kind in Australia, developed the Rural Clinical School concept, the concept of longitudinal integrated clerkships in a rural com context uh, in Australia, but as it always reminds us, he actually is, uh, was, and actually still is, a rural doctor, he still practices uh, in a rural area, not far um, from Adelaide. But what we've talked asked him to talk about today is from that experience and from his involvement internationally because he's been involved in many different countries uh, working alongside local folk and we've seen how well he works alongside local folk this week I might add. 
worked a long time in terms of developing medical programs, reviewing curricula, uh, developing schools, etc. So we've asked from that experience, thinking about that, what can we think about in terms of the future? Where are we going to go? Where might we be going? Do we know where we're going? What are some of the trends that are happening? Uh, to remind you though that if you read the invitation, it was an invitation to a workshop. Uh, so prepare for the fact, as uh, Franz alluded to, there will be some time for the discussion. Um, but thank you very much, Paul, for uh, agreeing to do this and to lead us into the discussion and through the discussion. And we look forward to the time. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been delightful to uh, to be here uh, in the Cape, uh, to realise that I'm in the south, the south part of South Africa. Uh, I always thought of it as the west, but uh, it, it, uh, it is the southwest, but it's certainly a south. Uh, it's lovely to be here because it's in many ways so similar uh, to the really beautiful place that I live, uh, which is also a city which has the sun set over the ocean, uh, rise over hills rather than mountains, uh, but be surrounded by equally beautiful vineyards. Uh, so uh, I'm very much at home with you. So thank you for the invitation. Thanks for the invitation also to have an opportunity to think a bit more broadly about uh, health professional education and the future. Uh, for those of you who, who read the literature, you realise that this is something that I have put my mind to and I'll discuss uh, later on uh, some of the uh, papers that uh, I've written with uh, David Hirsch and uh, uh, colleagues from Toronto as well about uh, where the future uh, might be leading. Uh, but to set the scene, I, I thought um, firstly, I would tell you about a uh, story of one of our students. So, uh, uh, this, this student uh, had come to our school from a background as a psychologist, uh, very concerned about people's well-being, people's uh, mental health, and uh, concerned about whether he would be able to actually make that transition to being a doctor from being a psychologist. And he came to me one day and said, I just had the most amazing, amazing opportunity at the time. And what had happened was this. Um, he was working in a small hospital. Um, for those of you who know who are Sarah's, you know, Sarah's and, uh, uh, the district uh, hospital there. Sorry for my pronunciation if it's completely wrong. Sears. 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 Sorry. Yeah. I, I looked at all the blank faces. <laughs> <laughs> There's something wrong here. <laughs> Sears. Uh, and, the, uh, and the district hospital there, you know, uh, a small number of doctors uh, looking after a uh, constellation of people, again from very different backgrounds that happen to be in uh, the And he was there for the, uh, for the whole year, and part of what he was doing was uh, seeing the patients who were in the hospital. He would do a walk around every day and see all of the patients and get to know them. And he was just uh, sitting down in the, uh, the nurse's station in the middle of the ward, uh, only one ward in this hospital, and uh, riding up and the uh, head of nursing came and uh, he said, oh, you know, have there been any new patients come in? Uh, who do I need to go and see? And she said, well, you can go and see uh, this patient, this patient, this patient, this patient, uh, but you please don't go into, into that room uh, because uh, in that room, there's a, a lady who's dying. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate for you as a student uh, to, uh, to go into that room and uh, you know, that very private 
special time. Um, so we sort of started making these plans. Um, we understood that, that, that that's actually a good South African term is to make a plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so you made a plan. Uh, and about uh, who he was going to see it was just uh, doing some reading up about the conditions that he was, uh, you know, medical conditions he was likely to face in those uh, rooms so that he could get, uh, uh, be uh, organised before he went in there. And while he was just sitting at the desk, um, a man came out of that room who was told that he shouldn't go into um, and said, uh, Jerry, Jerry was his name, uh, Jerry, could you please come in? So I find it a bit hard telling the story, but I'll not persist. Uh, could you please come in? Because Mum would like you to be here. Now, he then had the opportunity to go in and hold that lady's hand while she died. Why was he given that opportunity? Which was just so profound as a student to be invited. It's a that special time of person's time. The reason he was given that opportunity was because he knew that woman. He had been the, the nurse who was supervising the hospital didn't know this, but he had been there when the diagnosis had been made. Months before. He had been there when the chemotherapy and radiotherapy had been decided to be finished. But he had been there through the family consultations. So his was, experience was not a learning about a cancer. It's about learning about a person. And being invited into emotional, social, psychological, biological, spiritual aspects of that person's care and that person's experience. You can understand why he was very moved and never forgot a whole lot of biology never forgot a whole lot of the pharmacology behind that. Never forgot a lot of the psychiatry involved in that. Uh, never forgot the physical examination and finding the large liver and all of those sort of things that uh, we tend to focus on so much in our uh, health professions education. And yet we don't tend to focus on, well, why should I bother learning this? What he also said to me was a staggering thing about this day was that the next person that he was called to see uh, was the exact opposite. He was called in to see a lady delivering a baby uh, who again, he had been there when the pregnancy had been diagnosed, he had been there looking after that. So again, he wasn't coming in as a voyeur to sit in the corner of the room and then awkwardly watch while the lady went through labour to do the baby. He was invited to be part of that. So I say that, I guess, because it reveals part of uh, my motivation for being an educator. What a privilege to be able to organise a curriculum and organise assessment so that students can get those opportunities. Um, our students come into our courses, firstly, as the lead. And it's one of the benefits of public professional education is we get really bright students. And we get students who actually want to make a difference in people's lives and engage in their lives. And we tell them, well, you've got to put a hold on that aspiration until you graduate. So, yes, we know you want to get out there and make a difference, but you're actually incompetent until we give you a piece of paper. So, please just watch for a while. 
long than six years in some courses. Um, and, and then you will be able to get out. What do we find as a result of that? We find that that idealism and that social orientation and that patient orientation doesn't stay steady, certainly doesn't increase, actually goes down. So that by the time the opportunity is there for these graduates to actually start in their caring professions, they've lost part of their care. Um, that's a problem. Take the right person across all of those fields and, and uh, emphasize one aspect of that brightness, the intellect, the memory, uh, but not at not the other aspects of what that brightness is. Are we really doing a job? Have we, have we lost or something? So, excuse me, I'm just going to blow the noise properly. <coughs> right, so how's that come about? Um, it's come about through very good intentions, very good uh, just over a hundred years ago, uh, there was an uh, uh, American, Abraham Flaxner. Most of you who uh, have done any reading about uh, health professionals' education will know about Flaxner and about the Flaxner Report. And it's become sometimes a bit of a pejorative historical oddity, but it wasn't. This was a person who was passionate about the public getting the best care possible and about real inequalities in the output of what he was looking at, medical schools. Uh, but he could have just as easily looked at, uh, at, at other schools. And he wasn't a doctor. Uh, he came from a teaching background. Uh, he had family who were doctors, so he sort of was in the family business, he understood it, but he was very much an education. And what he said was that what medicine needs to do in order to guarantee the output is going to be of high quality is first of all, it needs to be located in good universities. And secondly, those university medical schools need to be engaging with science far more than they have been. So what had been happening before is that people had essentially been finding events or becoming the practice or they'd been uh, in variable quality institutions and farmed out to various places and you know, pick up a bit of knowledge as you go. And Flexner said, that's not good enough. Our society deserves better. And the places where that science and the good quality supervision were co-located at that time were the public hospitals, the large public hospitals. So he said you need to contract medical education to large public hospitals, <coughs> call them public teaching hospitals, and we need to look at making sure that we get all the sciences really well taught first, and then clinical experience under a variety of supervisors with good quality assessments and examinations. And in order to get that quality, we need to first get quality people in, so we need to have selection processes which are based particularly around your knowledge of science, because medicine needs to incorporate science, it hasn't been doing that. So that's about 1911 or something like that. It was a really big step forward in terms of quality assurance, quality, quality improvement uh, in medical education. It subsequently infected or affected uh, all of health professions, education. Now, that was great. The trouble is that that's no longer the world we live in, is it? Um, health services aren't orientated anymore around those major hospitals for the treatment of the common maladies that affect our population. Right? Even as short a time ago as I was a medical student, and then an early graduate, we used to admit people for hypertension. 
And it wasn't just overnight to confirm what had happened. We would meet them for days, sometimes a week. Um, I was uh, using this brand new drug called Captopru, <laughs> which was uh, an anticholinesterase inhibitor, ACE inhibitor, if you've, uh, you've heard the term. And we had to admit patients to hospital to initiate treatment with an ACE inhibitor because we were petrified that if we allowed them to use this dangerous drug at home, they would have a hypotensive episode, fall over, break their hip, or uh, contuse themselves. So we admitted them to hospital for days to titrate in ACE inhibitors. Now, that just doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just one example. Essentially, hospitals have become giant intensive care units. Uh, really important as a component of the health system but no longer representative of the broader health system. And the patients who are there, no longer representative of the people in the community. The illnesses that those people face, and therefore the treatments and the management and the diagnoses that our students need to work with. So we have a, uh, we have a problem, you know, we have a system that is has been <coughs> devised and developed of selection, of basic science treat, um, instruction, of clinical instruction, um, and, and, and uh, assessment of all of those, um, that is really not that much different to what was designed by Flexner 100 years ago. However, many other things have changed significantly. Talk about some of those other things outside of the, the health system uh, that will change significantly. But I, you know, just I check my watch, uh, which is connected to my mobile phone, which is connected to my computer. Um, that's all. That's all changed. Uh, we, can, we can talk about that, that further. But the suggestion I would have to you is that what we saw in the 21st century, 20th century may actually be an anomaly if you look at the history of medical education, which was very much distributed across society, very societally based. Now that's no matter which I'm using medical, first of all, in a sense of health professions, but secondly in terms of different cultures, approaches to healing. If you look at healing education, that's been a societal based uh, activity. The 20th century was brought into very discrete institutional based activity. Is it actually that it may return to become a society based activity afterwards? First question. Second, second sort of comment would be with the democratisation of knowledge I use that term, let's, let's unpack it, the democratisation of knowledge. What that means is that a place like this is no longer the repository of knowledge. Now, that you and I, as the staff in places like this, are no longer the, uh, the priests of knowledge. <coughs> uh, and the reason is because most of that is in here now. And here goes everywhere and is accessible everywhere. And in actual fact may know more than me. Not may, does. <laughs> because the field of knowledge has expanded so greatly. My grandma was a, uh, a rural doctor and I knew her quite well as a young, so I didn't know my grandpa who was also a um, But she would tell me about the 13 drugs that she needed to know as a doctor. <laughs> and that includes brand names. <laughs> so, you know, just the ACE inhibitors that I mentioned, you know, there are way more than 13 ACE inhibitors, just as one little bit of one little bit of going. So, 
things have changed a bit, and it's no longer possible to have everything in here. Um, it's no longer possible, and actually, have to have everything in this building in terms of the knowledge of uh, to be a health professional. So, how with the changes in society, with the changes in health practice, with the changes in knowledge availability and accessibility and acquisition? Add that to the changes that we've had in our understanding of what is education. Again, our, our understanding of education probably came out of school education. Uh, for those of you who use the word pedagogy, uh, you would know that pedagogy comes from the Latin of pedes, pediatrics. So pedagogy is actually the parent teaching the child. So we now know that education is much more complex than that and good education at the tertiary level is certainly done better if it's done in different ways. More than that, we actually now are developing evidence through MRIs of what's actually going on uh, inside people's brains. So we're no longer having to look at elaboration, for instance, as an educational contact, uh, construct that sort of has come out of some hypothetical uh, observations of people's behaviours, we can actually look at that occurring inside people's brains and see which areas of the brain are working or not. So our understandings of how education works, if you like, have flipped. Uh, I'm not just referring to the flipped classroom uh, in that, uh, that statement, but they've certainly changed a lot, which have challenged a lot of the dogma that we took as fact, that has now been revealed to be dogma, about what is good quality educational practice. What is good quality assessment practice? Uh, all have been challenged by, uh, by these concepts. So, lots of challenges. The, the beauty about what's happening is that we've got a fantastic natural experiment occurring around the world. Because there are institutions who are breaking out of what used to be and saying, we're going to give another way to go. We're going to try this, we're going to try that. And what's more, they're actually doing that now with an emphasis on research at the same time. So not only are we going to try new things, but we're going to research those things. And in fact, we may choose to try something because someone else has done some research and we think there's some evidence for it. So no longer is education or health professions education a research-free zone or an evidence-free zone. Uh, I think it used to be. Uh, I think it used to be uh, EBN, and you know what EBN stands for? Uh, Eminence-Based Medicine. <laughs> so there are two EBNs. There's Eminence-Based Medicine, in other words, what the person out front, or the person with the highest title, or the person who earns the most money in the organisation, uh, says is right, <laughs> or there's Evidence-Based Medicine an evidence-based health professional education. So I think we've moved slightly, are moving, uh, from an eminence-based approach to an evidence-based approach. And that evidence is being accumulated all over the world. Thankfully, through these, we can find out about them. And through you know, reading the, you know, the articles that are being published, and there's more articles being published now than there ever have been, and so much so that we probably don't think we can keep on top of everything that's going on. But we actually have access to it, so no longer can we say we're stuck in the Western Cape, um, and therefore it's just what we think here uh, that uh, we're going to be able to access. No, we can get information from Alaska. Uh, that can inform, inform what's happening in the Western Cape uh, as much as we here in the Western Cape can inform Alaska. So a very different environment, a 
an environment that would cause us some concern about our current practice and an environment that gives us some tools and some opportunities to say, well, our future uh, health professions education could be very different. Okay. The last thing I would say in the introduction, <coughs> so the end of the beginning for us today, uh, is if we don't do it, if we don't uh, get to a point where we are providing the highest quality according to evidence, health professions education for our students, someone else will. So that's the other change that's occurring, globalisation. So no longer, and I would predict it might be perhaps 20 years, perhaps 10, perhaps even less. In fact, in Singapore it's happening right now, and I use this example uh, often, no longer just because we are the local university, the local division, the local school in this area, do we have a right our students perspective to be the place that they go to learn. Not only is travel so much easier that people can travel around, but you can stay here and you can learn again through these sort of environments uh, without having to go to the US or having to go to Europe or having to go to uh, Zimbabwe or you know, any, any other country. You can learn from institutions. So if you look at Singapore now, uh, I'm very close to, uh, uh, to us. Um, the number of universities in Singapore uh, teaching face-to-face -face in Singapore, I would estimate would probably be 50 this is one city. And that's just the health professions education. I mean, in the health professions. Uh, if you just look at medical schools that offer the full <coughs> medical program, uh, there are four. Two of them are Singaporeese. One of them is Duke University from the US. One of them is Imperial College London from the UK. Based in Singapore. And that's not even doing it by distance with intensives. That's just saying our brand is now global. So what would happen if Harvard decided he wanted to set up a paper? and run a physio course, an OT course, a nursing course. And if that's not a thing that you'd like to contemplate, uh, given the current leadership of that country, oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, and, and all of the colonial implications of that globalisation happening again, because that is what's happening in education at the moment. There's a recolonization. I understand that decolonization, colonization, colonization is really important here, as it is in Australia. Uh, but I put to you that there's a recolonization at the same time. Uh, it's just not happening with troops, it's happening uh, through other means. Uh, so if that's not a thing that you see as helpful, for the local context, then how can the institutions here be right at that cutting edge, providing what is needed, so that there actually is no reason or opportunity for a recolonialisation to occur from outside? So it gets back, gets back to issues that are really sensitive, really important bring back hurts, all of that. This is, this is not just an academic exercise, because the consequences of us not doing this well open the door to things that may not be as good as we're doing at the moment. So, just a few things to, to sort of percolate in your minds. Now's the time for you to do some work. I've, I've learnt uh, from, uh, from Ian, Jackie, uh, that uh, a new definition of workshop. Uh, so this is a workshop. 
Like workshop means that I work and my wife shops <laughs> at the same time. Um, and I must say, I'm a bit jealous of her. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, <coughs> been a lovely, uh, a lovely break for her. So I'm going to have a little break now. We're going to do some shopping. No, that's not true. Uh, you're going to, but you are going to do some work. Uh, because, uh, again, uh, firstly, what do we know about education? <coughs> Coming to a two-hour seminar and just writing notes about what I say is not good education. So let's practice what we preach a little bit. Eh? Uh, and secondly, uh, there's a whole lot of expertise in this room that we need to tap into. So I'm going to ask that uh, we're going to break into groups and we are going to look at uh, envisaging the future in four areas. I think uh, those four areas are selection, student selection, Assessment, basic sciences teaching, and clinical instruction. Across professions, I hope that there's going to be people on each table that are representing different, uh, different professions, different disciplines, etc. So those four areas, and I've, I've just chosen those because um, they're very flex and okay? Uh, they're selection, assessment, Science or the underpinning knowledge, if you use different terms uh, in, your, uh, in your discipline, and the clinical instruction or placement of the learning, uh, which are the term we wish to use. And we're going to break into four groups. Uh, we're going to have workshop that around the table. So I want you to appoint a facilitator who's going to be responsible for making sure that everyone can talk and everyone gets a chance to listen. Uh, around the table. Uh, you need to appoint somebody to write some notes who is then going to have to do the grooming um, and uh, get their eyebrows plucked uh, from the camera because I'm going to ask those four people to come back uh, and present uh, the views of the group uh, around those four issues. And then uh, Francois and you and myself uh, will provide some reflections on the ideas that are put forward by the groups. Um, Francois, it's obvious why I'm asking Francois to do this. is sponsored by Sahi, and thank you for that. And uh, <coughs> as president, I think it's uh, great uh, to have a South African perspective in the reflection. And I realise I'm in South Africa, so uh, that's that's important. I do come from SAE. Uh, we do sometimes get our mail delivered to South Africa. <laughs> instead of South Australia, um, <laughs> but I'm not South African. And Ian, I've asked to uh, give some reflections because uh, a lot of what I've uh, been talking to you about and involved in this presentation has come through work that Ian and I have done, and workshops that we've done at uh, other conferences like this. Uh, so I want to acknowledge his uh, intellectual uh, input into uh, to what I've been saying and to this process this afternoon. So, Four groups. Uh, what's the time, Francois? What are you? Quarter to two. Um, let's look at uh, about uh, 20 minutes in groups. Um, construct yourselves so that those people who are wanting to look at selection come here. Those people who are wanting to look at assessment come in this area. Basic sciences back quarter and the clinical instruction that back quarter. And I would encourage you, if you find yourself in a group of 20 <laughs> who all want to look at this one thing, to get out of your comfort zone and go to one of the other groups. You should be able to have four groups of about 10 people in, in each of them. And you're going to get an opportunity to be able to uh, listen and, and uh, contribute uh, to all of them when there's that feedback process. So don't feel as though you're just locked into that. But Think about those, those, those four areas of, well, what is the future? If we're looking at the future of uh, health professions, education, in selection, what does that mean? In assessment, what does that mean? In, in the basic sciences or the underpinning knowledge, what does that mean? In the clinical instruction, what does that mean? And what I'd like you to do is to try, not only to say, I think this is what's going to happen, but to do the because. Why? So I think this 
we're, it's going to look like this because x, y, z. Now, now that because may be some articles that you've read or some evidence, or it may be a political uh, situation or a social situation or whatever, but uh, just make sure that you, you, give, you take, give yourselves the opportunity to go that next level down in terms of our educational practice of actually forcing ourselves to ask why. Um, that will help when we sort of pull this together because what I'm hoping is that there will be a little bit of a uh, sort of a roadmap for people to choose from or a smaller board for people to think about, not only of ideas but also of evidences that you may want to then go and look up and do some more reading about to see whether, well that sounds good but I better look at the evidence that you think you know, supports that and that will help our uh, own So, um, 25 minutes, uh, selection, assessment, rearrange the chairs, uh, yourselves, uh, basic science, uh, knowledge, knowledge of health and illness, if you like, uh, and uh, the attention. So, the, one of the things I always sort of look at is the, uh, the mobile phone index. Uh, checking the email index. I didn't see any <laughs> uh, in that uh, discussion, which was fantastic. So uh, I'm, I'm glad people were you know, really engaging. So what we've got now is about uh, a short period of time for each of the groups to present and then to open that up uh, quickly to comments, um, discussion. Uh, so if possible, is it possible to try and keep your presentations to about three minutes, some maybe 30 seconds, but please no five, ten minute presentations, okay? So, so about three minutes and then we'll open up to the, uh, to the broader discussion. At the end of those four, we'll then have the opportunity for uh, Ian and Francois and myself to give some reflections. So who's from selection? So, come out, please. Thank you. Okay, so, I did have my phone out when I was taking notes. <laughs> Elise always looks at me strangely when I take my phone out. <laughs> okay, so, um, sorry, I have to apologise, we haven't come up with a solution. Oh. <laughs> 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 But we did have some interesting conversation around this and, and uh, the first point that came out was obviously the selection criteria around grades, um, which obviously we, we, I think most of the universities are still using. And the fact that just because um, an individual has a higher grade doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be a good doctor. So um, the comment was made that we potentially could look at not so much grades, but looking at the holistic student, and then breaking that down into what is a, a holistic student. Um, so looking at academics versus passion and ability for, for um, care. Um, looking at the fact that it's obviously quite time consuming doing interviews, so how could we get around this um, in another way? And one of the biggest portions of conversation that came up was around using a pre-selection criteria in the form of not necessarily a course, but um, something that the students or the applicants would have to do as a prerequisite to being accepted onto the NBCHB program. So something like uh, volunteering or working in healthcare in a number of different, being offered the choice to work in a number of different healthcare environments uh, for a year or two prior to actually getting into an academic program. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily just be practical. There would be an academic process involved um, where you would have to submit some sort of academic um, research or feedback, and as well as working within the community, the healthcare community, to um, get feedback from how you work practically as well. And this would hopefully give the students or the applicants a chance to get an idea of whether they actually wanted to be involved with healthcare. Because this is what we find um, students don't or applicants don't necessarily know what being a doctor is. So it's actually understanding that what being a doctor means. 
Um, and then I'll have to get back onto this. Um, so this would be a sort of undergraduate process and then looking at selection with maybe involving the community, not just the universities at the selection level. So involving communities, um, academic processes, and uh, going from that. The maturity thing came up. So what is maturity? Would we be looking at an age thing or an emotional um, intelligence aspect? What about RPL? So there are a whole lot of things we would have to consider with this um, as a pre-selection criteria before you actually got selected onto the MBCHB specifically. So unfortunately, like I said, we didn't come up with any absolute solutions, but I do believe that there are processes that we could follow to come up with a better number of um, doctors that really want to be doctors. So not doctors that are going to lose to overseas or going into um, working as hairdressers or research and mothers or, yeah. not that I have anything against mothers because I am a mother, but yeah, losing, losing professionals. Not Great. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there a particular order in which we get to feedback? Because our group would serendipitously very closely follow that, if, if that would be alright for us to speak to. You're going to speak second. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Right. One, two, three, four. Oh, can I just make one comment before I finish? Part of this process is also looking at um, not being an expensive process, so you actually use people in the workforce to help with health care. Um, so it becomes a less uh, complicated process around huge amounts of funds being fed into a system um, and you actually help with the workforce from a, from a lower step. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, what you didn't do was the second part of the task, which is what's the evidence behind those <laughs> suggestions? <laughs> and it's yeah. a really tricky thing mm -hmm. in selection, uh, isn't it? Yeah. Because there's very little evidence, evidence to guide our choice of selection instruments, uh, for instance. There, there may be some uh, evidence around uh, reliability and validity in terms of do you do the uh, multiple interviews or do you do the, the single interview, but the evidence around any type of interview in terms of ongoing practice uh, beyond potentially communication skills in the first year reasonable attendance, the evidence of any admissions test around science knowledge, or selection on science knowledge, and any tenuous beyond the uh, performance in basic sciences in the first couple of years. Tenuous. Um, I did a study in Australia about uh, the ongoing practice quality and the only element high school entry students who was predicted to see their scores in English. Um, and who knows why that was um, they couldn't say, but you know, they just looked at all the they looked at all the associations, so there was a positive association with scoring, which doesn't mean it's called causal <coughs> association. So comments from people about that? I just want to um, have just a theory about speak up the camera. <laughs> I have one query um, about the sort of one year or two years that a student is meant to work somewhere or do something else in terms of research. How about the funding? I know you don't might not have the answer to this, but how about the funding work for that? Because I mean, first three years and students in this country pay um, student fees, which is a huge problem in this country. How will that work? Because I can see that people in the high end of income would be able to sustain your job for a further one or two years. What would happen to the rest of students who don't have that dance? Uh, no, well, so you'd actually work in as, uh, I, I, well, I'm speaking up the group, but you would actually work in as part of the workforce. So it, it, would, be, it would help as far as um, maintaining some sort of, you get some sort of pay for it as, at the time that you're learning. So it's almost like an apprenticeship um, while, you, while you're learning and while you are um, working through this process to see whether you actually want to do medicine, whether you're going to be um, able to do it. So, you know, you wouldn't be part of that portion of the course as such. You would become part of the workforce. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. I don't know, can you? Yeah, I think we were, <clears throat> sorry, a little bit far, because part of the ones I thought that this should be part of your pre-grad or your life experience. So life experience for everybody is different. So actually uh, encouraging people who want to apply to go into the real world and volunteer, to be part of the community, to know what it's like to model life in the society, to go to classes. <laughs> Because I think that will filter out a lot of the people who actually don't want that from medicine or from that health. Um, yeah. So looking at that, then being part of um, that period of time to mature, what that means, and then also using your phone to learn the clinical sciences, doing an entry level clinical science exam, and through those multiple measures, then having access to university. Okay, comments? I was chatting to industrial psychologist who um, used to work for a, he was committed <coughs> by a big corporate company to help uh, recruit graduates to who they would train to suit them. So it wasn't into what you studied or what your grades were, they were looking at the person, the competences. And I'm just wondering if, because he said, um, it's a massive, you need a massive database of stuff, but basically, they can very accurately, through a very short interview, determine what someone's potential to yeah, fall so well in that job come up in the yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because I was just wondering if you don't <coughs> use the expertise of people like that. Yeah. Yeah. If you yeah. can predict how many people can predict. My point is that there is a literature out there, the evidence base that's used in other industries, yeah. we haven't used in education. Let alone health professions education. But the, but the challenge with, um, with the expertise and the tests and the interviews, how culturally specific are they? Because um, my challenge is, is that all these tests are great, but a, a student from a different culture who is not from the test culture, if I might yeah. use that mm -hmm. mainstream, you know, might not do might do poorly, whereas um, all the other things flow into it. So unfortunately this is, I think and this is what is evident in our group, that this is not a, a quick fix um, thing. That selection um, is very subjective and one has to be very careful of navigating through it. But one has to understand the culture of the institution of higher learning in which it functions. Um, and draw on that to draw up specific criteria. Okay, so thank you for that. We'll, I'll just make two quick comments. Um, one is um, the aspiration for selection. So what is the objective for, for, for selection? And one of the points that I've made over the week here is um, does your student cohort represent the cohort of the population. So what do you need to do in order to get a better representation of the population in your student cohort? And clearly those issues can sometimes come, they can sometimes be worked through with subquotas. So if instruments are uh, sort of uh, specific and going to be uh, preferentially advantaging some students over others, Sometimes subquotas is a way of getting around, so you're at least only competing within your group uh, of equally disadvantaged or equally advantaged uh, students. The other thing I just put out there as an example of how somebody else is doing this is the, uh, the example from the Philippines of the uh, uh, Leyte branch of the University of Philippines, where they get the community to select from their community and they, they select a group of students who become, become community members. They go and they learn, become uh, at the university, they then go back and work in the community as community members. From that group, the community then select a group of those community members to become nurses. They go back to the university, they become nurses, they go back to their community and they work as nurses in the community. From that group, they then select a group of those nurses to be 
become doctors. They go back to the university, they learn to become doctors. That's the career path. So there's all sorts of issues of professional dominance and hierarchy and all that incorporated in this, but I'm just, just saying is that they call it a step ladder uh, sort of approach. Uh, Realising that in the Philippines, many of the doctors train as nurses afterwards. <coughs> many of the doctors train as nurses because they want to get employed in the US. And it's easier to get employed as a nurse in the United States as a Filipino than as a doctor. They then go back, train as a doctor, they then bonded for 10 years to work in the community and sponsor them right from where to go. Because the community pays for their training. Exactly. It's a, it's a community based selection process. The university does not select the students. So, what was interesting in you know, what we were talking about was who does the selection? Um, yeah. Do you want to talk at the end? No, I just want to make a comment in terms of yeah. uh, the, for the data example. So, they don't have places for individuals. No. They are places for communities. They say, okay, this community, this Malantai village, is going to have two places next year. 80% of household heads have to sign approval for that. It's those two students who are chosen by the community before they can go. So just, it, it incorporates a whole lot of different concepts just, just to, uh, to, to think about. So, basic sciences, please. Yeah, yeah, please come to the front, it's easier for the camera. We were a small group, so we don't have a lot to say, but why um, my colleague wanted us to follow up is that um, one of the visions that we have um, in future, um, part of selection, part of getting the foundational knowledge is that there will be a way in which, uh, there will be a change in the way that students learn and students will have to start deciding from school already, do I want to maybe medical, nursing, um, physiotherapist and so on, and then they will be streamed. Um, subjects will be chosen um, because of what they want to do and um, we have also envisaged a, a, a program like a pre-med program where students will, or uh, those who want to become medical students will either have to <coughs> volunteer at hospitals and even follow um, um, a pre-med course, um, maybe like e-learning, do some pre-learning courses, which will then form part of the selection. The problem that we have in the country at this moment is that there are not resources available because not everybody has got access to internet at home. Mm -hmm. So at this moment there might be, yeah, um, but in future it can still happen. Um, then we have also um, one of the uh, points made tied in with the um, explanation that we gave of that skill that said he had that wow experience that once students um, in any of the medical sciences are exposed to patients, it becomes not only the anatomy, the physiology, the pathophysiology, um, but it becomes a person to them. And it becomes the condition as a face. And then the um, underlying knowledge gets stuck. Um, but we have also, and we haven't yet got a solution for that, the, at those, uh, at this current moment, we see that the basic, the anatomy, again, physiology, students think, okay, I have to do it in the beginning. Once I've written it off, I'm finished with that. And we have to um, provide a culture of lifelong learning. And we have to underpin the basic anatomy or the, the basic science, that what we are doing, you are never finished with the basics. Um, we have to refer back to the basics. They can never say I've written it off in my first year and I'm finished. And that is in a nutshell what we have. Great. Great. Thank you. So, um, comments from people about uh, learning the basic sciences. My initial reflection was quite thinking. My initial reflection is that um, what you were talking about, I mean, when you use the word pre-med, I, I think United States. 
Yeah. Um, so I think the concept of you go and do a pre-med college course and you then do your medicine after that. Um, now you could bring that back to high school, uh, in which case you think Russia. Uh, and you know, in Russia you decide at the end of high school whether you're going to become a physician or a surgeon. And if you don't have a Bachelor of Medicine and a Bachelor of Surgery, you go this way. Now, there, that's, there are different uh, colleges and courses, but uh, they had a very early specialisation. And one that was, it's cheaper to start learning. If, if this is what you're going to be, you're going to be a paediatrician. Start now. Um, why learn about all the other things and take a whole lot of taxpayers' money? So, uh, just reflect on it. Has there been any research on the job satisfaction of those that have been sort of specialising from really that they think that's what they want to be, but how do they feel Impressive. 10 years into it? <laughs> but, but, but ask, ask that of uh, any doctor who's locked into a small subspecialty. Yeah. And the experience of people who get to my age is that a lot of them are going to mm -hmm. uh, That often is good for medical schools because they get a new lease of life by becoming a teacher. Mm -hmm. It gives them something to do. Um, or else they get into stocks and shares or <laughs> real estate trading. Or yeah, gambling and drinking. <laughs> oh, yeah, gambling and drinking, etc. I mean, you, 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 look at, you look at a lot of the pathology that is in our professions, a lot of that is around having been constrained to a, a narrow box for a long time. But basic science. So, instead, the issue of integration versus subjects. Um, the integration, the issue of problem-based learning, case-based learning, team-based learning, flipped classrooms, uh, those uh, other comments from people? <coughs> yes. I'm just concerned because our high schools are such a mess. Our high schools are such a yeah. mess. How's this going to work? You know, yeah. um, my husband's a high school teacher, so I have first-hand <laughs> stories every day. <laughs> and kids not coping in the subject and wanting to switch more course from grade 11. And, you know, those kind of things, it really is a mess. So I'm not sure if it's going to work at the master level. It would be wonderful. So you're making, sure. a, you're making a wonderful argument for graduate entry. Yes. And one of the reasons that we looked at graduate entry at Flinders was that we realised that kids from rural and underserved backgrounds never competed with kids in private schools high school level, but they showed their they showed their true stripes by the end of their mm -hmm. first degree. Mm -hmm. So we went to the graduate program for diversity and equity But back to the basic sciences please. Yeah. Um, I just, sorry, so a comment oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just gonna wonder if maybe the separation between the basic sciences and the clinical sciences is I mean we know that it's artificial. We take a patient and we split the patient up into anatomy and these things. And as the student progresses, we say, okay, well, now you've got to figure out how to bring them together. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we, we, we simplify that complexity to make it easier to teach and to assess. Mm -hmm. um, isn't it better to integrate the complexity earlier? Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. Um, I, just, I just want um, to get back to high school. I think where it's interesting, it's um, important, not necessarily at a pre-med grade, but if you are interested in one of the healthcare professions, it's important for that child to choose the correct subjects because we see it on a daily basis that they come to, to be trained as a nurse or someone, but then they didn't have the science in school. Um, so that is where it becomes very important if you are thinking about the healthcare profession, those types of subjects should be included in your curriculum. So what? You said look at the future. Well, UCL or Duke, or well, somebody's going to do this. They're going to come up with a pre-med course that is international, global, whatever. And people are going to turn around and say, hang on, it would just be interesting if the word is Pat Smith or the generic applicant has got this Duke diploma pre-med. Isn't that the way things going to go? Somebody's going to do it because there's money in it. There is huge value. You think of all the aspiring medical students. Mm -hmm. And if you can just get a hundred dollars, a hundred rand 
from each of those around the world. Yep. My biggest issue is with, with uh, students coming after school is that you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And so you have to have some sort of exposure to something that will represent what you're going to study, what you're going to be involved with for the rest of your life. Because let's face it, medicine, if you're going to practice as a doctor, that's your life. That first and foremost, you are a doctor, um, or whatever else you become you know, in healthcare. So I believe that, and I agree totally, that you need to integrate. But why are we breaking things into boxes? And it is for our benefit as educators. It is for our benefit. It's not for the the students anatomy box and the physiology yeah. box. Well, well, many schools around the world don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah excellent. So just just we'll, we'll, we'll keep coming back to selection, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but uh, just the, the last point that we need to move on. Uh, so you may be interested that uh, you, you talked about the, the order that we do things, you know, basic sciences. So the Harvard new course, their, their new pathway, the new new pathway, they've had a new few new <laughs> uh, they have uh, one year of basic sciences, they then do their major clinical year, they then in their third year go back and do another year of basic science. They call it advanced medical sciences, so they do basic medical sciences, clinical instruction across all the different disciplines in the second year, advanced medical sciences in third year, which includes their, their research uh, component, and then the final year is basic going around and trying to get a residency, but it's, it's clinical. Really. So they've interleaved sort of uh, science, clinical, science, clinical. Just, just a, uh, a, a thought to, uh, to leave you with. Okay, speaking of the clinical, let's, let's move to the clinical. So point number one, the patient has to be the centre of whatever we're doing. And we keep on moving away from the holistic approach and we want to be back with the patient in the centre. Then um, Austin Hirsch has written a lot about longitudinal placements and that is something that we would love to see. Um, and the placement being authentic, so learning from engagement with the patient. Um, going a bit back to what Prof said, you know, it's not just a diagnosis, it's not just the liver in bed three, it's Mr. Smith who happens to have a liver that is diseased kind of approach. We would like things to be participatory and involved, and we had quite a lot of discussion around not just the student, but also the teacher of the student. Um, that they have to have an authentic relationship, and the relationship has to be built over time, that they need to have a trust relationship, and the fact that the teacher also needs supporting and possibly assessing. So that, is, that goes back to you all, with Frank would be assessment, it would be interesting to hear what's been said. Um, so it's basically sort of formative, active learning type of stuff. Then rethinking the outcomes, and thinking about how we formulate the outcomes um, and being less silo, that's also come up in the discussions already. Um, so Biggs' constructive alignment or also transformative learning are some of the things that we're thinking of. So, um, let me just see, where am I? Okay, then the idea of placing and interprofessional com inter complexity of students, is that right? Yes? <laughs> <laughs> so we were told, I was told not to say an interprofessional team because that's fraught with problems. But when you have an interprofessional complexity of students and you give them the task to respond to the disease burden that they have, then, um, and, and to see it maybe with research, the effect of their um, involvement there and whether there's a change in the burden of disease. Okay. Then um, we also thought that if this team is together and they have a common goal, that will build the team, even if they don't know each other to start off with. Then also parallel preparation and placement. 
so there's to and fro with what you were saying now with the interleaving. And um, also to recognize learning beyond just the stated outcomes, which goes back to transformative. Great. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to ask, uh, one of the biggest issues around clinical teaching is actually having enough patience for the number of students that yeah. you have. So, um, what what are the <laughs> got enough patients for some, yeah, not not dispersed. So, around dispersing students into areas, or how how would you go around getting that clinical. Um, Exposure to students. How would you? We didn't discuss that actually. We didn't discuss that. Sorry, uh, that's that's, <laughs> that's that's an epidemiological question. I put you. Uh, there's uh, you can you can identify the patients that uh, you need in your curriculum um, to cover the, the core conditions. You can use epidemiological data. So in a community, how big a community you need to be in in order to be able to, to see that. You can then look at, uh, if you want, health service utilisation data and that sort of thing. So you can actually do that in a, in a data-driven way. So that you would actually get your students out, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. At the moment, I mean, we use skills centres and we use models and everything else, but it becomes very expensive. And, you know, it's still, you are still sometimes to get that exposure for your students. When we so. did that modelling, the areas that struggled <laughs> to be able to provide enough of the common illnesses and uh, diseases and conditions that the students needed to see were the tertiary hospitals. Interesting. Okay. Were, were the tertiary hospitals. They were the ones who struggled. Uh, now that's in Australia, What's, what's in the tertiary hospital differs in different countries over the last time. Okay, other comments about the clinical? Yeah. Um, I like the idea of this um, research. Just speak that. up a little bit. Sorry, the authenticity of the placement. Mm -hmm. And um, I think also the framing of the patient as a person, because in the first example of the narrative, it wasn't about the diagnostics. It was. And um, it's interesting what you said setting too because a lot of the experience is medical some of you also where our students are placed in a, a clinical education or practice learning site where they actually become quite immersed in the community and um, proven to be quite successful in terms of the dynamics of their personal advancement and professional advancement and um, much like Australia they don't lack in areas in which to place students more remotely. So, you know, and this is not something novel, but do you think it's something that we haven't perhaps aggressively pushed? So you use that word authentic learning, don't you realize we've written some nice articles about uh, authentic learning, authentic clinical learning uh, as a concept, and also what are the prerequisites that we need to provide for our students in order for them then to enter authentic learning environments and not slow them down. Um, in fact, what can we do so that students can enter authentic learning environments and actually be an advantage for that environment? So certainly one of the issues that we've looked at, and Lucy Walters has done some nice research around this in the community, is uh, in terms of clinical learning, how can it be seen to be an advantage to have a student rather than something that slows you down? That has a whole, actually now a science behind it, so there's some evidence behind the answer to that question. So, uh, clinical learning, just, uh, just something to, to throw out as a challenge. Uh, so, University of Minnesota has a, uh, a track now where instead of clinical learning being based around adult patients with a block of paediatrics, their clinical learning is based around pediatric patients with a block of adult medicine. <laughs> in other words, when they're learning cardiology, they're learning, kids. When they're learning about uh, musculoskeletal, they're learning with kids. 
we seem to learn on adults. Mm -hmm. uh, they just question it and said, what if we flip it? They're doing it as a, an educational experiment, just as a, a, a little, uh, and they're also doing it uh, with what you refer to in terms of the longitudinal integrated model. Mm -hmm. of, uh, <laughs> Um, so let's get down to assessment. Thank you. Here come the team to tell us all whether we've done it right or wrong. <laughs> so to start off with, we also didn't go to the, the evidence. But um, what we, the first thought what we would um, suggest if we could really reimagine assessment in the future is to, to not have formative assessments, not, 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 not to have formal assessments. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yes. So, to first of all, reimagine um, what we want that person to be competent in before we can think about what assessments should look like. What do we value as competent? Because that is all the things that should be assessed and then when the students are assessed it shouldn't be a summative sit down right for three hours about all the theoretical knowledge that you anyway have in your phone <coughs> you can look up at the time and um, maybe getting back to what you suggested now the learning should take place in these authentic learning environments and that's also probably where the assessment should take place so the students should be assessed in a formative way, continuously, multiple um, opportunities by a whole team, which could include the patient. Like your example, if the patient asks for the student to come in and hold their hand while they're dying, the student should be competent in some area of, of clinical competence already. Um, the, the whole team includes things like 360 degree feedback from not just the supervisor but every, everyone who works in that authentic learning environment with, with the student. Um, we had ideas such as it should be more integrated and assessment shouldn't be in compartments. I think that speaks to what a lot of you have said already. Um, it should be less focused on marks. Um, and we got to the, the idea of um, if, we, if we don't have standardized assessments, how will that influence the way that we, that we assess students? But it's not so much about um, ranking students against each other, because that's probably why we want standardized assessments, but ranking students against themselves. So if you are in, a, in an environment where you can continuously provide feedback, it's not about today you've got 60 and tomorrow you've got 80, but today you are doing better than you did yesterday and you can also assess their ability to make use of the feedback that you provided on the previous occasion when, when you saw them. Um, and then, I think that was, that was the, the main focus and then we want to add something that was that Great. Was my group. Thank you very much. Now, I didn't pay you, but you actually described our assessment process. <laughs> 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 so, so, we're not the first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I say that and don't take credit for it, but uh, we, we have what's called programmatic assessment for learning. So, every assessment is formative, every assessment is subtle, they are constructed in place and students are assessed against the whole graduate outcomes four times every year in the course, right from day three of the course. And they get feedback straight away. They get all the answers to the questions straight away. Uh, and four times a year they know how they're progressing uh, to uh, the graduate the required graduate outcomes. Uh, so I just put that out there if you want to look up programmatic assessment for learning uh, with uh, Lambert Schuer, who's the person who's done a lot of this work. He initially did it at last week, uh, and then he's uh, now carried it out at uh, Flinders. But thank you for saying that. <laughs> um,
and, and you actually you actually advanced it further than us because uh, the authentic environments that takes place depends on where you are actually having the students for all of those things. So that's great. So I just wanted to make a point on how nice that whole assessment is because it also, by giving feedback to the students, it allows them to understand where they are emotionally and cognitively on each particular day, which we tend to discredit completely when we do summative assessments. So we put these students under huge amounts of artificial stress, and we expect them to perform on a mannequin that cannot give them feedback, and we can't give them feedback. So we have to stay objective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so these first students that may be brilliant in a clinical setting are completely flawed in this artificial setting. And it, it's so unfair because it does nothing to improve their learning. It just brings them down. Yeah, so no, it's programmatic assessment for not just on learning. Are the comments of assessment? I think I was in the same group. Now, the element that, that we focused on was the <coughs> reflection on the, um, in other words, what do you learn from the process, which comes back to the example that you used in the beginning. The value was not, was of being, being there and not uh, necessarily fulfilling the role whilst being there. Now, does anyone want to talk about the assessment and cost, the concept of trust? Uh, so the concept that you know, we are assessing students so that they can be trusted by the health system and by the community to provide the services as nurses or OTs or doctors. Uh, this has been built into the EPA framework. Are you aware of the entrustable professional activities? Uh, so if you want to look up in EPA, uh, it's again led by another Dutchman. Can anyone give me his name? Oli Ten Kat. Yeah, uh, C-A-T-E. Uh, thanks. And so Oli's work around entrustable professional activities. And interestingly, when you start looking at that process of entrustment, it then asks you about the whole course. Well, does the course have to be six years? Or does it have to be four years? Or can some students trusted before then. If our assessments are robust, can we actually have a more flexible time when students can graduate from being a student to a junior doctor? And I'm sorry, it's been done. Uh, so again, there's an it's experiment, uh, but there's an experiment going on in the US at the moment about a pathway from uh, admission to medical school, not from high school, but from admission to medical school to graduation as a, as a consultant, where the point at which you swap over from being a student to a resident is flexible, according to when the clinicians trust you to make that step. So an interesting concept. Uh, as a dean, very difficult to budget <laughs> for the medical school, but should we just be driven by, by that? That's uh, an interesting concept. So, let's uh, Ian and Francois, so if I can get, uh, where's Francois? He's right, right here in the front. Um, so Ian, uh, some, some reflections from the, the work that you did. Um, thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, Paul and I had to, we were listening to the radio this morning. We actually weren't listening to the radio, we were having a conversation, and I heard on the radio this morning uh, some research reported from East Anglia University that they were saying that people who are involved in the arts, not, not necessarily as professionally as artists, but those involved in the arts so show greater social inclination and are more likely to be helping other people. So maybe that's something we should do in selection. <laughs> if that is true, we need to get the evidence to make sure that it's true. But that's something perhaps that we can do in selection. But the comment I wanted to make about selection is that we select people who are going to pass our courses. 
And that's always the problem. You know, that, that if we have courses that are very science-based, we've got to make sure that we have people who can get through those sciences. So at WITS, I know, they love quoting the fact that people who score highly in maths do the best going through medicine. But that's because it's a very scientific maths-based curriculum that they have to learn. So if we want people who go through a different kind of curriculum, then we must look differently. The other thing is that uh, I remember way back when I was a medical student being told by one of the first professors of medical education in South Africa, that was uh, Jacques Creel, when I was concerned about my grades, he said to me, you know, they've done work internationally around comparing grades when you leave medical to school to how you're rated by your peers as a professional. There's no correlation. So he said, relax. Don't worry about your grade. Which is quite radical for somebody uh, in medical education. And you've become a professor. <laughs> you told me yesterday a professor is just somebody you can speak a lot. So. <laughs> Well, the, question is, <laughs> the question is whether that is a, an endorsement or an endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're putting it completely. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, in terms of what I was going to say, I was going to make an important point that I think that is completely, uh, completely forgotten. Now, what I was going to say, so in terms of the grades and so on, a different approach to assessment. Coming back to the Palo Leite example that Paul used, they have two grades only that they use in their program. Pass and needs tutorial. There's no fail. And each tutorial means that the teachers have been given enough support in order to enable people to learn what they need to learn. Well, that's very different from our mark-based, everyone wants to score higher kind of approach. Um, so that's an alternative way of looking at selection. This year, patient-based learning, and this is both the clinical and the basic sciences. I was involved in developing the clinical associates program uh, nationally and in the course of VITS. And I often say that we did everything we wanted to do in medical education that weren't allowed to in the clinical associates program. One of the things we did is from the first month of the first year, the students see patients. And all their learning, their basic science, all learning is around the patient. They learn about diabetes from the first month. But they're learning also about glucose metabolism and also about um, cellular function and etc. etc. and about pharmacology all around the patient. Now there are many things from that, but one of the things that we've heard from specialists in some of the hospitals where they interact with the clinical associates, they say they're able to talk to patients and relate to patients in a way that many of the students can't. Because they've been talking to patients right from the beginning. And it's just natural. Yes, the whole of things about who we select and, and kind of the people who become uh, clinical associates, but uh, I think that's a key point as well. The last thing I want to say is, I suppose not to hear from the clinical training group more about context. Uh, and the issue, it was, it was mentioned, alluded to, but I think that we have to talk a lot about what is the context where people learn. Uh, Paul was talking about, you know, in terms of who we select related to the con context of our country, but who we train is equally, I mean, where we train is equally important related to the context, uh, where our patients are and making sure we're doing that. And one of the things that works so well about longitudinal programs is that context is so important. The whole lot of other things that are important, and Paul and I have had this debate around what is the most important thing in a longitudinal program. Is it the integration? And I think that's critical. Is it the continuity? But the continuity of what? There's both the continuity that was mentioned of supervisor and relationship with the teacher, which is critical, but also the continuity with the patient developing that relationship. And I actually think that Mentoring may be one of the most critical components of longitudinal programs. The relation with the teacher actually helps someone to develop and grow, which in fact um, can be done. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, so I've also been trying to think about what is what have been some common themes across what we've been talking about and how does it apply particularly in South Africa. And I think the I think the main thing that I've been brought to think about this afternoon is I suppose in the in captured in the question whose interests is the design of the system that we have serving? Um, is it designed to serve the interests of the communities that need our help? Is it designed to serve our entrenched interests as the body of experts housed in a university that there is this aspiration to become part of the body of experts that is housed in a university and that that almost perpetuates itself? Um, and that that perpetuates a particular model of training which is not necessarily, in fact, is not in the interests of our, our patients, our communities. Um, and do we have an opportunity in South Africa with the imminent rollout of the, the new system, if it gets with its feet, if it works, to really fundamentally rethink how we approach education, how the professionals in this country in a way that is designed to serve the interests of our communities and our patients across these different components from the selection through to the assessment. So I guess, yeah, I guess that's that's the fundamental thing that that I'm, I'm taking away and wondering about is whose interests is the current design serving and what our issues are at play in that and, and how do we that as a change project to make it fundamentally different 10 years, 15 years from now. That's what my life's been involved with for, for many years, and I'll just give two hints uh, that, can, that can help. The first is, recreate or create in your classes, in your cohorts, in your courses, small different contexts for learning. What that enables you to do is to pilot things in a small group. It doesn't have to affect the larger group until you can collect the evidence that then can be used as a basis for discussion and change of the larger group. So for us, a lot of the generic educational things that we changed were able to be done in the small rural groups that we had purely because they were small and because they weren't risking the, the vast majority of students. Uh, so I just give that as a, as, a, as a hint in terms of ways of change. See if you can create within your systems, and that's one of the advantages of distributed education, is that you can actually pilot <coughs> things uh, step by step without this the whole system going into chaos of, 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 uh, of change. Um, the second is that there is a literature around change in institutions and change in behaviour, and that is the literature around disruptive technologies. So, uh, look the word up, Google it. Uh, the, classic the classic example is the... Uh, the Quartz watch uh, and the Swiss watch. So the Swiss watch makers never thought that the Quartz watch would take off. Anyone would bother buying it because it was inferior and cheaper. 
was basically because it was an inferior product. They underestimated the appeal of cheapness. And they underestimated the ability of the quartz manufacturers to improve their product so that it was actually better. The other classic example of, of that that's given is the IBM computer versus personal computer, the PC. And I'm talking, I'm talking the IBM mainframe, which was sort of this size room. <laughs> and IBM said personal computers will never take off. No one will ever want to purchase anything that's that incompetent. We can't do all the things that our big mainframe can do. Well, it's a long known story. IBM almost went bust. Um, but the, the way that uh, disruptive technology works is that it is almost always seen as inferior to start with. And it accepts that. So that's okay. <coughs> it is almost always cheaper. So there's a societal benefit there, cheaper. But the other, the other type thing is particularly important. It almost always is meeting a need that the current technology doesn't. Whether that's price, whether that's convenience, whether that's access, or whatever, whatever. It's actually meeting a need. And because it's meeting that need, it then leapfrogs the old technology. So the two, the two sort of hints. Use the natural variation of the natural <coughs> groups or create them uh, in your classes so that you can experiment in order to create evidence to, uh, to move things ahead. And don't be frightened if the initial response of the status quo is that's going to be inferior. Now, we had, I can give that example of both of those things with our rural curriculum. It was initially seen as inferior by the status quo. And we could only do it because we had a small group in a small area. Now, those students proved that they actually did better uh, than the students in the, the environment, and it's flipped our course on, on its head. And what we developed in a small rural area is now being used in the city. I could go into a whole lot of things there, but you'll have your own context. You'll have your own rural small group. It may not be rural, and it, uh, you know, it may be in a, a, another context. And you'll have your own uh, idea of examples of what is disruptive to your organization, what is the disruptive technology. But there is a literature out there on, the, on how to do that, how to manage, as uh, Francois said, you know, the power issues uh, that go with this. And I think uh, I'd like to finish, Francois, on what, what you said, because in the end, our moral imperative has to be that we are doing this for the good of our society. Again, if we're going to disrupt things, we have to ask that question, why are we disrupting them? Is it just because we want power in the institution? We want to say, most people are in charge, now I want to be in charge. So I'm going to do something different. We see lots of examples of that, restructures, and all of those things uh, occurring on that. But why are we doing it? What is the purpose? If, that, if that's our plot line, then even if we don't get to exactly where we want to get, we know we're moving in the right direction. Thank you very much.